All right. Well, maybe I'll kick off with some introductions and then we can we can dive in. So for everybody who's jumped on, thank you for joining us. Uh, our mission at Airdrie is to write the first check into an idea that goes on to become a global household name. And that's not easy. So our job is to help accelerate that journey and hopefully smooth out some obstacles along the way, make it a little less bumpy. There's a bunch of stuff that we build out behind the scenes just for our portfolio. We're also conscious that we want to grow and support the ecosystem here in Australia and New Zealand. And so that's why we host events like today. Going Global is a series to help you expand overseas and build a world-class business from day one. If you missed our last session, we'll pop the links in the chat so you can check out our conversation with Sam Cronenberg, CEO of Cloud Guru, on his experience expanding internationally. But today I'm delighted to welcome Monica Austin, who's CMO at Linktree. Mon spent the last two decades leading tech and entertainment brands, including Calm, which is the number one mindfulness app globally, where she was global head of marketing and led their ex exponential growth during the pandemic. Before Calm, Mon led global creative marketing in original series at Netflix and also spent time at Facebook leading strategic entertainment partnerships. And Mon manages to all, do all of this from her home in Hawaii. Uh, lucky you. A couple of housekeeping things before we start. Thank you to everyone who pre-submitted questions. We're going to try and wrap them into the conversation today, but also please drop questions into the chat so we can get to them towards the end. And any other comments and, and things you have in the chat, please keep it, keep it going. We'll try and respond as, as we go. So Mon, thank you so much for joining us. I guess like to start, you've had a pretty amazing career at some big, big brands meta calm netflix now linktree i guess what's drawn you to those roles and are there any particular marketing campaigns that you're proud of hmm. well first off thank you for for having me uh, i feel really honored to, to join today and and be part of this discussion obviously love working with the airtree team so yeah gosh i hearing two decades of work it, <laughs> feels Make really, it like, <laughs> really does. but I think I, I look back and, you know, my career has been really made of a couple things. One is just really relentless hard work and some luck. And what I kind of realized really quickly was there is no, there is no ladder, but what really drove me, if I think about you know, the, the roles and how I got to these different places is curiosity. It's actually one of the things I I tell everybody on my team to have a lot of curiosity, a lot of a growth mindset. And so that took me to places where I was really attracted to disruption and really unique, hard, interesting challenges. So when I got to Meta, Facebook at the time, you know, they had almost no relevance in entertainment with celebrities, with influencers. And a lot of my peers in the studio system were like, studio entertainment system were going, what are you doing going to Facebook, Instagram? But I just knew, you know, it really was the future. And I had a small part to play in, in bringing some of that relevance to the table that is now just part of their, their playbook. Similarly at Netflix, it was kind of starting to become a, a, a notable consumer brand in the US, had started streaming, but only barely, but was virtually unknown outside of parts of Europe. And so again, just a massive high growth opportunity. So, you know, those are some of the things. And now couldn't be more thrilled to, to join Linktree, which, you know, feels very similar in terms of massive opportunity, a real disruptor in, in this category, builder of the category, and with a massive opportunity ahead. As far as campaigns, oh, this is like picking like your favorite child, of which I had two <laughs> and not my favorite. But some big sort of notable ones, I was really privileged to work with Disney and, and uh, J.J. Abrams on the launch of the new Star Wars. Uh, we did this in partnership uh, when I was at Facebook, and we built the first of its kind kind of VR experience for that, um, and the first big uh, film partnership that we ever did uh, at Meta. And that was just like a wow moment. At Netflix, uh, the list is really long. I'm sure we'll get to some other examples, but there was one that I really had to, it was like pushing a boulder up a hill and it's now become 
you know, part of their kind of ongoing strategy, I created the first sub brand for them, which is Netflix is a joke. It's their comedy brand. And we started with this huge um, kind of uh, earned first idea to kind of make fun of ourselves and, and call ourselves a joke with billboards all over town. And then it kind of rolled into this broader campaign all around our standup kind of lineup. And it's now five years later, it was just, uh, they just had a comedy festival for Netflix is a joke. And so I feel really, if I look back at some of those moments of how hard it was to get that campaign off the ground, it's really worth it seeing it kind of come to fruition to what it is today. I often think about like what Netflix has done for broadening TV, like foreign language cinema is a thing again. And like, I feel like stand up comedy is one of those areas as well, where like it wasn't a thing. And then Netflix has kind of made it a thing and made these comedians careers, which is is pretty, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, Having a really good platform and letting people tell creative stories um, across the globe. It was a really new idea um, and seeing how those things translate um, universally was part of the building blocks, especially to global success, uh, for, for that business. I'd love to spend a bit of time. Obviously the whole purpose of this series is like helping businesses, largely businesses that kind of started in Australia, New Zealand, really think global from day one and, and build that into their kind of marketing DNA. Are there any kind of first principles you think about? Obviously it's, it's very context dependent, but like if you are, you know, a series A stage or seed stage founder who is, you know, they've, you maybe got like a couple local customers, but you haven't really expanded internationally and you want to like lay the foundations for becoming global. Is there, is there anything you would kind of start thinking about from day one as, as you build that framework? Yeah, going back, I'll use, you know, some examples at, at Calm. When I joined, they had really solidified themselves in let's call it the core English markets, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and even the UK. Obviously that was where the founders actually were as the number one mindfulness app on the marketplace, uh, uh, mindfulness and sleep. And when I joined, the goal was how do we start to expand this beyond our current uh, market, which we know we're, we're doing really well. So we started to look at a couple things. One was in other, let's call it English adjacent countries, let's par- parts of Europe, which have the most similarities to let's say the UK and US audience that we were already doing quite well with. Where is there already a market for a similar product that we have, meaning they have local players with a similar, whether it's a meditation app, a mindfulness app, sleep, et cetera. And we were able to really quickly, you know, you can look at and find that data sort of anywhere. Note that Germany and France and parts of the Nordic had some local players. So we already knew there was a market for the product that we were, that we had. And so that's one thing to start thinking about is where is there an existing base and already maybe a product market fit? Uh, You're just might, you just might not be there. We also at that time started to do some, let's call it rest of world growth based marketing. So performance based essentially to start to test into, Hey, what what would happen if we started to run some media into these markets uh, and just get some signal on how much uh, we were generating? And so we started to pull that in and, and really start to understand. And we weren't spending, you know, very significant amounts, but we just were using it un- honestly to test and understand things like pricing sensitivity, things like messaging, our value proposition to understand if we were actually meeting the needs. The other thing we did and this was a much bigger undertaking, is once we decided that we wanted to really expand into some of these markets, once we had a signal, we went, okay, we're going to focus on the markets that already have an existing competitor. And we're going to go hard in there because we already know there's some existing demand. At that point, we went heavy and did some additional research and segmentation to really understand the consumers and the consumer need. Backing up before I joined, They had done a go-to-market in uh, Japan, and I can't speak to exactly the the data set that they were looking at, but what 
essentially we figured out is there was a real mismatch on product market fit. And there was really not a real demand, despite they put a big go-to-market launch. They did a lot of activity in, in, in market, PR, with social, with paid. And the LTV CAC was just upside down in that. And then once we did a little additional research, what we sort of figured out is mindfulness and sleep means something very different in Japan than it does in other parts of the world. And so had we had that additional layer of information, we probably would they probably would have made a different decision. Another example from Calm is we did a similar go-to-market in Brazil. And Brazil had different challenges. The big one there was pricing and packaging and also on the payment side. This is something we encountered really early at Netflix as well, was not that there wasn't necessarily demand or willingness to pay for the product. We saw strong signal, there was strong social, there was great PR response and, and kind of awareness in the market. But they, when it came to app-based businesses, the willingness to pay or the ability to pay with a sort of traditional payment mechanism was very different in Brazil. And we really needed the BD team to help us and go in and figure out payment solutions. And that was something at Netflix that was a big learning we talked about for many years, many cycles, is making sure that as you think about these priority markets that you want to go into, that you have to make sure you have the right stakeholders at the table to do so. So I can expand anywhere in a couple of those places or if folks have some, some additional questions in the chat, but obviously it's very dependent on the product that you have that's gonna determine you know, how you go to market. So you know, whatever's most relevant in there. Yeah, um, and that, that Japan one's interesting because I think that you kind of forget that because like we watch kind of English speaking media and we, we live in our own little kind of filter bubbles on the internet that, that different cultures have such different expectations or such different, I guess, like experiences of everyday life. Um, that Brazil one was pretty funny too, because I remember Linktree went through exactly this two years ago. Um, around Brazil. So that's, that's not surprising to me, actually reassuring. Yeah. But so. like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I was going to kind of, you, you were talking there about like England, English adjacent markets, and, and there were quite a few like foreign language examples in there. I mean, I guess one of the, one of the really interesting things is that, you know, even in English speaking markets, you have nuance to how people speak and joke and everything else. Like I've noticed it as like a kind of English immigrant into Australia. There are so many kind of cultural nuances and the humor's so different and areas like that. Have you, have you kind of, do you have any advice on um, how to think about talking like a local brand, even when you're kind of expanding into a market that seems relatively similar? Yeah. This was a this was a this is still an, an important one we're obviously working through at Linktree today, which is essentially we are a global product centered and built in Australia, but the US is our our biggest market, our biggest opportunity as well, the biggest TAM that we can go after. And so we're now in the process of kind of realizing that we actually need some folks in the US, boots on the ground who have seen kind of this rep before, have been in sort of high growth organizations, who really understand the customer and our consumers, who can really connect deeply with, let's call it the creator economy and the influencers that we really need to, to bring on board. And we're in that process of, of hiring into the US. One of the things that I always lean on is experience at Netflix. And I think we did this pretty well by the end is as we started to expand, what we really wanted you to feel was that Netflix wasn't a tech brand, wasn't a Silicon Valley company, that Netflix was a Spanish brand, that Netflix was a Brazilian brand, that Netflix was a US brand, a UK brand, et cetera. And what that meant is you needed to really deeply understand your local consumer and the sentiment and awareness and really build from a local first mentality. And so in the early days, what that meant was we went in first with comms and with social. 
And we often did that through kind of scrappy agency partnerships, right? We didn't even hire folks on the ground first. It was just going with some agencies. They have our kind of global playbook. They have our strategy. They have the roadmap of, let's call it product or content initiatives. And let's go start to make some noise on the ground and with a local voice that can really connect to uh, perception or sentiment or uh, and give us the watch outs as well. And then over time, we started to build out local teams. And the key there, from a, even from a marketing perspective, was, uh, this is a bad analogy, but we used to talk about it sort of ad nauseum, which was like the global teams, let's call it, that are kind of responsible for the building blocks, the foundations of whether it's a strategy, a campaign, an initiative, they're baking the cake. The local teams are responsible for icing the cake and decorating the cake and really bringing that local flair to it. The best case scenario, though, is where you're baking the cake together and we can start to feed out the, the ingredients, if you will. I hate this analogy because it just goes <laughs> on. But it's effective in the, in the sort of like tangibility of it that you can start to bring in then the, the local insights first and then we can build a campaign that we know can connect. Now, the challenge for a global team is you can't build anything for the globe. You, you will eventually build for no one. And so building a core that we knew was translatable into these other markets was really important and having a real baton pass where the local teams could go really deep based on insights on their consumers, based on data and based on their own strategy and, and really make it come to life in a way that it felt Spanish or Brazilian or German or French. So if you were a kind of startup who's just... You know, that's like figuring out you've got um, a constraint set of resources and you think like, when is the right person? When's the right time to, I guess, do this like agency way of doing things? And then when's the right time to put boots on the ground? Obviously, it's again, like context dependent, but when would you feel like is you've got enough signal or, you know, it's worth making that investment? Yeah, of course. We had some pretty clear benchmarks that we were looking to hit when we did this at, at Netflix. When I joined, and I, I don't want to use big examples, but I think what they brought to it was a lot of rigor, even though now it's quite a big company at the time, it, it was relatively small. And as I said, there was almost no awareness for not only Netflix, like what, what is that word? but streaming. And so, as I said, we'd go in first with sort of social and comms, let's get a read. Then we were looking at the data to understand what was driving subscription and understanding what types of content was driving subscription. And at a certain threshold of subscribers, we then would trigger, okay, it is ready. It's now a sustainable market where we know there's an opportunity to, or some additional TAM we want to go after to warrant boots on the ground. In parts of the world like APAC that were, became this sort of competitive set where a lot of other players were trying to get established first, or we're sort of, you know, as is common, sort of stealing playbooks and going in really hard. We we actually went in as a more uh, comp you know, competitive initiative. We were seeing more churn than subscribers at the time, but we felt it was really important that we had boots on the ground there. A lot of it was for government relations and legal, because what was happening in streaming, because it was a new category, is a lot of regulation. Regulators were coming in really late. Some were more harsh than others. And as you can imagine, when you're talking about things like free speech and a U.S. company coming in, making content for the globe, but there is a lot of nuance to consider. And so that was one where we put a lot of boots on the ground, not as much marketing, not as much content. In the beginning, it was a lot of legal NGR because we needed that representation to ensure that we weren't going to get blocked and banned in certain countries. And so it, it kind of depends on, on the market and the nuance and the category to figure out, you know, when, when is the right time or, or when are you too late to, to do it? This is um, a bit of a segue, but when you said that, it kind of made me think like, wow, what, you know, you, you had that, I guess, 
free speech government relations experience at netflix and then i guess at linktree you have a very like it's a similar but different challenge of where do you take a stand and where do you not take a stand and what where, what's the role of a company in politics and where isn't it and like have you do you have any kind of insight into how you think about that internally or you know even specific examples if you're open to sharing i think it is a really slippery slope so at Calm, this was a big initiative for us too. How much do we want to get into politics and regulatory conversations? Less regulatory, let's call it healthcare rights. And in the US in particular, these are places that are, are very fractionalized, very polarized. And you can find yourself, if you're not really careful, on the wrong side of a conversation. And that was something we were really mindful of. At, at a mindfulness company, uh, <laughs> at Calm, and it needing to feel that we were sort of Switzerland, if you will, and and sort of made it a point to not take too much of a stand on political issues. Now, our category, that category, wasn't getting heavily regulated the way that, let's say, in Germany at the time, Netflix was going to be regulated along with the rest of the internet or in parts of the Middle East and Asia that they wanted to ban our service because of the content that was on the platform, mm -hmm. right? So these are different existential threats mm -hmm. that we had to combat. I think for a product like Linktree or even a mindfulness app like Calm, don't, don't rush into a legal or not illegal don't rush into regulatory uh, points of view government points of view or political points of view until you see that there's really sort of a demand to do so or a need that's going to impact your business because it, it's not a winnable often conversation to be part of and as i said if you don't have the right boots on the ground whether that's a comms agency or a consultant especially on the government side it can be a really sort of hairy situation. That said, at Linktree, one thing that we have kind of shifted course on from a mostly a comms and a social, let's call it tone of voice point of view, is having a bit of a point of view on what's going on at the platform level. And the kind of control that they have at this big level that folks like our creators, our linkers are at the mercy of. And so that's one way we've sort of said, we're not going to go into sort of regulatory battles or, or step our foot into sort of the government side, the political side, but we do want to act on behalf of our linkers and they actually want someone to stand up and, and kind of be the voice of the, of the category. And we felt like we had enough credibility to do that. And in fact, when we have done that, we've also garnered a lot of great earned press, a lot more sort of awareness and, and brand love. And, and ultimately, you know, we've seen that even impact the business. So I'd say early stage, avoid it as long as you can, but make sure you have a really strong, you know, legal team that's keeping you apprised of things that could be on the horizon that you should be thinking about. And I guess maybe this is a an interesting segue into, you know, a, a Linktree, you are marketing to linkers, but like linkers are such different types of people. And so and I, I imagine it was very similar with marketing to consumers at Netflix or similarly, you know, Facebook and and uh, and Calm. They're kind of these general purpose products. I guess with Calm you can be a bit more segmented, but like how do you think about you know talking to the individual when you have such a broad spectrum of individuals that you're trying to talk to? Um, no, yeah. it is it is the the marketer's challenge. Okay, so one of the things we've been focused on here is getting out of conversations about features. All right, we can talk about features all day, updates to product, great, great, great. And I think we've we've done that in the past. And I think it's it's not emotionally connecting sort of with anybody, but it's great information that our linkers should have. The other thing that we had been really focused on were these verticals we want to build for. Let's build for music, let's build for creators, let's build for small business. 
But even within those verticals, wow, you, you still really broad. You can start to really build for, for everything and everyone. And, and it's easy then to point back, well, this is for music. I'm going to build this for music. But what we're now trying to get to is a much higher order level of thinking, which is ultimately what problems or jobs to do do our linkers have that we need to solve? And how much can we get at the behaviors and the motivations behind them? And then we can start to really like point the arrow in the right direction. And what we found is essentially for Linktree, folks want to come to us to they have the same set of challenges. They want to unify, engage, and grow their digital ecosystem to do the things they care about, you know, which is generally around monetization and potentially mobilization of their audience, right? Telling tickets, merch, et cetera. And so if we can sort of think about that as a higher order, then we can really get into like who we're building for and why. And then on our side of the house, on the marketing side, I think about it in sort of a hierarchy structure. We've obviously got our business and, and comms narratives that we want to seed over the course of, let's say, a half, a quarter, a year, and with goals associated. On the social side, we think a lot about channel-specific strategies and seeding out who are we. We can talk to our linkers all day. That's great. We want to do that. We want to make sure they have messages. But we also know that we want to build the foundation with Gen Z, our future consumers that probably aren't aware of us or aren't using the product today. And we really want to speak with an authentic voice uh, there. And we're making some good, good progress in that direction. On the rest of the house, we've kind of focused on how do we connect to these essentially couple of marketing pillars that we want to win. And we know that our product connects to authentic, authentically. One is, as I highlighted kind of before in this example of kind of speaking on behalf of the creator, it's really showing our expertise in the space and that we are a trusted resource for creators to come to. And so that's helping us kind of really narrow in then on the types of activities, the types of messages that we want to get across, all in the, the overall focus of driving word of mouth. And so that's kind of the, the overall goal for, for the back half of the year. I feel like you said something else I was going <laughs> to hone in on, but now I, I, I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. I feel, but... like, I feel like you answered the question. I, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but I feel like I've now digressed from the point of the conversation, which was about going global. So I will, I will direct it back to that. But knowing your consumer and who your ideal consumer is and having those personas of who that ideal person is, like we talk about, we are going after a sort of this hustler creator who usually has a side business. One of my favorite examples is Headley and Bennett. It's this wonderful founder. She's her own kind of creator, if you will, her own influencer. She has, a, she's an entrepreneur. She has her own business. It has its own presence. She has book deals and brand deals and partnerships, right? She's a big digital ecosystem and she's a real hustler. We want to build for someone like her who is really connected to our goals and our mission. And so, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, what are our linker problems? Who are they? Where are they? And, and making sure that we're, we're continuing to build for that. And I would say, as you think about global strategy, that's even more important when you get into those other markets, because to the point I think we made earlier, you would be surprised at the differences that you find market to market. I guess that's a the kind of the way you're talking there about ideal customer and then frameworks for that how you kind of the messages that you want to get out across different timescales and different channels. I guess that's a quite a good way to lead into how you think about you know coordinating teams across geographies as well and making sure that while they're speaking in a local voice, they're also feeding into the global message and direction and frameworks you have any kind of thoughts or perspectives on on the best way to do that maybe any examples of of where you've been yeah this one is is there's a lot of different ways to do it like everyone has their favorite decision making framework a lot of players have their favorite right i don't really care for daisy just fyi i'll be really <laughs> <laughs> but some people really love it and that's cool we'll adopt it there's a lot of different models you can 
you can implement here when it comes to local versus global. The way we're doing it, obviously, at, at Linktree, we are a remote forced organization and we have no plans to change that. Although, as I mentioned, we are really focused on having some boots on the ground that we think can help rapidly expand our efforts to really capitalize on the momentum that we have and the product market fit we have in the U.S. And that includes really scaling up our product engineering and marketing resources, as well as our partnerships teams in the U.S. Now, the ways that we organize those teams is something we're in constant discussion about. And we haven't really hit a, a moment where we feel like we need to put a tremendous amount of rigor to this, but there will be a point at which we do. The way that, meaning, do we want teams that are cross-functional all in the same time zone working together on the initiative? That's one way to do it. Do we want certain teams that can work asynchronously that are based in one geo? And it kind of doesn't matter because you're all kind of implementing together and you can you can share and it doesn't matter what time zone that you're in. Or do we want core functions to always sit in Australia like people, legal, you know, HR, things like that. And then we have the rest of the teams kind of decentralized across the US or, or even other markets eventually. So we're getting to the point where we're going to have to to put some pen to paper there <laughs> and make some decisions. I'm sure Jax, it's one of the future board meeting. We'll talk about this. <laughs> but one thing we we tested, so at Netflix, this was a constant state of discussion as well. It's a pendulum that swings between sort of centralized or localized. We opted, or like I think let's let's say the first assumption was, hey, we need to extract the the knowledge base that we have of how this company works. Netflix is also, also a very cultural forward company. It is classic tech with a really specific culture. And it was really hard to be able to replicate that market to market. You almost had to have kind of worked at the, the Death Star, if you want to call it that, to understand how the culture worked from the inside out so that we could replicate that. Because that was really part of the secret to the success of that business when it, when it came to rapid expansion and growth. Brutal performance driven at, at all costs. And so the goal was, let's start with a centralized model. Everything will be driven from, let's say, the global team or from Los Gatos and Los Angeles. And then we'll have local teams that can execute on the ground. But what I think Netflix did really well is they also tested a GM model. And a lot of businesses love a GM model where you've got a central leader who has all of the business units that roll up into them that can make decisions. Now, that helps you with a lot of local nuance and being able to make decisions really fast on the ground. Ultimately, we tested that in really difficult markets like Japan, actually, and parts of APAC. And we found that the centralized model, the the model where we everything ratcheted back to the, let's call it US team, worked better in our high growth years because we could connect the dots on context for what other markets were learning and that each market didn't have to go through the same trials that the other markets did. So that was one way that, that Netflix approached it. But my team, for instance, was roughly 140 people uh, with multiple functions and had both global and local folks. And the amount of times we kind of reorganized, reprioritized, looked at ways we can optimize and drive efficiency, we did until the point it became too disruptive to do so. And that's something you have to be cognizant of because the only constant is change. But there is a point by which there are diminishing returns to the continual optimizations, especially when you're rolling out something or have a roadmap and initiatives that you need to kind of be be mindful of. Yeah, and I guess so I, I think what I would take from that is essentially it's context dependent and try and see what works. And if it's not working, change it, but try not to change it all the time because like, the change management and organizational overhead and like constant conversations will probably end up slowing you down. That's right. And I think the, the key is that the team, the executive team has a strong and aligned perspective 
Because if without that, then you're going to have constant flux at the local level. And if everyone can be aligned on the operating model, whether that is central or GM based or some mix of the two, that's what that's what matters the most. Okay. Thank you. Please, everyone, put put questions in the chat. Love to see them. Uh, I should probably call out Claire's at, at this time. How did you conduct segmentation and customer research remotely? I guess when you got started at Com, we actually partnered with a, an agency to conduct that research. A uh, small agency. We picked a few countries to start, and then we expanded it as we went. The research project lasted. By the time we fully wrapped up the work, because we did, I think, nine countries, was about six months. Uh, but we really focused on how do we get some early insights into some of our priority markets that we can apply really quickly. Uh, and then we kept that relationship going. Uh, one of the things, we're doing a similar model at Linktree. So there was uh, an existing agency who did some some segmentation work. We did a follow-up to that body of work. Because this is a, something that I think is really important is the refresh uh, of segmentation work, right? It needs to feel really relevant. It needs to be really fresh. And especially if you're going to start to expand globally, it, it needs to apply to those countries and, and markets that you're going into. And so I think it's really important to either decide at some point to hire that resource inside. So at Linktree, we made the first consumer insights hire, and he is going to be responsible for continuing to keep that segmentation refreshed and running our own surveys and research in partnership with our product insights team to, to make sure that that is, is continually refreshed. Yeah, that makes sense. We should talk about when we, after this call, we should align. And if you have any recommendations, like one of the things that we always try and do at Airtree is like pull the best recommendations of if, if founders or exec teams have worked with service providers who were really good, we want to pull that in because so often service providers are disappointing. So if there are great people, we want to put them in our <laughs> yeah. little black book to, to, to well, offer to well, others. Um, Forget the funnel. I've been happy to provide their contact detail. They've been doing the research for us at Linktree and it's it's been pretty effective, pretty scrappy, cost effective. Yeah, for sure. Great. Great. Thank you. Here from Alana, what data did you use for reporting and for getting insights into and making decisions around each of, each of the markets? What data did you use for reporting for getting insights into? Any specification on at Linktree, at Netflix, or I can just give you kind of a, a cross section? Maybe just do a couple, yeah. a couple of them. <laughs> so the things we're looking at now it, for Linktree, so as Jax mentioned, we have core four, which is our core four markets that we focus on English language. And then we are running, as I, I mentioned the, that we did at Calm and, and even at Netflix, some additional, we call it rest of world media. And the data that we're looking at there is a, is a couple of things. One is just pure signups. What are we seeing on a signup and, and account creation? What are we seeing in engagement on a continual basis? We measure something called monthly engaged linkers what are we seeing on paid that's the thing obviously we're a SaaS martech product today we're a utility paid is really important to us and what are we seeing in terms of paid and we are always looking to at competitive snapshots to understand our pricing mix in, in those countries well i don't do them every month when we do a monthly business review i do them probably on a quarterly basis just to make sure that we're right sized in fact we just Jack's new info. We just found in the UK, we think we actually have some pricing power where we can increase our price in the UK because it's a little bit low based on what we're seeing in the market competitively and, and what we're seeing in the US. So that's what we're looking at today. Then we also will pull social data. We'll pull you know comms data and kind of just a competitive landscape, market landscape on a, on a semi-frequent basis to just understand, hey, are we missing something? When would be the right time? What benchmarks do we want to set to understand how we might want to go after maybe some of these other markets that are growing quickly? Thank you. We've got another question here from, from Adam around uh, the kind of difference you, you were mentioning with Brazil, like willingness to pay versus ability to pay. And I, it's, he says here, it sounds like there may have been a gap between entering with the attention only economy before 
convincing customers to actually pay cash. Do you have any good story details about what it might, it might have taken to make the jump, I guess, from free to paid? Yeah. No, willingness to pay is, is key. It's the thing we look at the most, and I make sure we certainly include in segmentation. I'll give you an example at Calm, where we were hitting a bit of a plateau on the, the subscriber side. So during the pandemic, we did see some exponential growth naturally. It was sort of the perfect time for a mindfulness product. And we had a strong product market fit. We also had great content and the brand, they had really invested wisely even before I got there. We really wanted to double down on what we knew was our competitive advantage for the future, which was the brand. And one thing I started to see though in the data was just not just like our funnel and conversion. And we talk about things like a, a, a leaky funnel, but um, our LTV CAC ratio. Now, certainly there were privacy, there was uh, iOS 14, there were things that sort of shifted it, but the drastic sh change signaled to me, maybe there's something else going on. So I look back at all the historical data, we pulled it out, we mapped it over our segmentation data. And I'm sure you're all familiar with sort of the S curves of, of growth. And we ultimately found is, you know, Calm had really cracked the code on performance-based paid social in particular marketing. And almost to the point before I started where it was a bit of clickbait, really, how do we get you in and download? And then suddenly you're in there and you're like, wait, I didn't sign up for this like oddly satisfying video. Where Where is it? But what happened, what we found was about 90% of our aware audience had already downloaded the app. And so we hit this real clear sort of ceiling where we had to decide how are we going to go out and remarket to them? We've now sort of driven all of this sign up or they have the app on the phone. Can we, can we re-engage them? What would that take? Or the other question is how do we raise our awareness levels with the addressable audience, which we, we knew was there, but that was going to be a pretty sizable investment. And so that changed the dynamics as we started to think about pricing and ultimately our business model in really understanding, do we need to go with a slightly more freemium service where we can get more folks in the door that um, maybe don't have as much willingness to pay, uh, but would be willing to sample our product and, and sort of uh, adjust the model accordingly. And so it's important that you're looking at as many of those signals as you are at the bottom of the funnel and making decisions, but also that you're really pulling out and understanding where you are in relation to your addressable uh, audience and market so that you can make the right uh, business decisions. I can talk ad nauseum about where we went to from there, but I hope that gives you a, at least maybe a, a good sense of how you could think about approaching it. Yeah. What a blessed problem having saturated your entire market. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about kind of the operational side of, I guess, global teams. And we talked a little bit about this with the, you know, thinking about time zones and, and whether you put people in time zones or you have the GM. And, and I guess I, specifically with regards to kind of Australians and US and the annoyance of time zones there, have you kind of... Have there been any kind of problems you've encountered that you've managed to reason your way through to a good solution in terms of working with Australians and Americans? I guess, like, what are the funny things that you hadn't anticipated that ended up coming up and how did you resolve them? Oh, yeah. So you mean, like, just culturally or more? Yeah, like that culturally and operationally. Okay. Yeah. Well, I tell everyone to move to Hawaii. It is the perfect time zone between <laughs> the West Coast of the US and Australia. That aside, which most people would happily take me up on, but but few have. Yeah, cu culturally. So one of the reasons I, I joined Linktree is my wife's Australian. And talking with Nikki and Alex, who are our co-founders, and Anthony and other folks on the team, I felt like I spoke their language. Right. And I mean that from like a, they reminded me of my brother-in-law, of our friends in Australia. There was a camaraderie, a, a friendliness, don't take yourself too seriously kind of approach. I'm also from the Midwest. Midwesterners and Australians really connect. We have a very similar sensibility. 
That is not necessarily true of the coasts of the U.S., New York and, and Los Angeles, or, or let's call it Silicon Valley. And so I really was like, oh, this feels like something that I really, like I said, I, I speak the language in a way. And a lot of people go, what do you mean the language? Everyone, they speak English. But there is a, a nuance. There is a difference um, in the way that they approach things. Australians have much better work-life balance there is a healthy and it's a it's not even just like they have it it's an expectation that is set and coming from some very big tech companies that don't really give a give a damn about your work life balance they really care about the performance and your impact not that you can't work hard play hard that that is very much part of us culture but the balance is not so much part of us culture and so I find there are will be friction between teams being like, why isn't this person online? And it's like, well, for them, it's 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., you know, in their time zone, or it's Saturday. And it's like, yeah, but it's only Friday for us. And it's like, well, then you need to work in a way that you're getting deadlines to them by Thursday, our time, Friday, their time, and making sure that the teams understood where they were coming from so that we could, you know, better collaborate and, and ultimately work together. The other interesting kind of cultural nuance, I think, is the way in which we take or give feedback. And while Australians are very blunt, I love the straightforwardness, the blunt, like, let's not mess around. When it comes to a working environment where they want to have a more, I would say, like, um, collegiate environment, more, you know, everything needs to be sort of friendly, let's, let's get on. When you get into really specific feedback, it, that felt really hard. And that was an experience I had at Netflix too, as we built out global teams, we were a culture of feedback. And sometimes some cultures look at feedback as a slap in the face where others are really embracing of it. And so understanding that and really being able to bring folks together in, you know, point them to the fact that it's best intent. It's about how we collaborate. It's about the end goal of the project, not personal really helped us bridge some of those some of those challenges but yeah there there are certainly some some nuances to that operationally as i mentioned time zones are really hard the the differences in time zones especially we have a few people on the east coast and it is difficult the folks in the us when I start, I start later in my day, so I can go a little bit later into Australia time. I know a lot of folks that do that in LA too. And, and we leave it kind of up to them as needed for a project without setting a mandate that they need to do so. But this is where things like documentation, we're a Slack heavy culture. Like if you're working asynchronously between time zones, then it's really important that you are documenting your work. You're using memo based formats. You're, you're updating teams. So they have an opportunity to come online, get the context they need and carry it forward. And that is something we've been really focused on implementing from a ways of working to make sure that we can stay not just like time zone, but, but certainly just remote working from here on out. I'd love to spend a bit like a dive into that a little bit more. I, I guess specifically kind of context feels like the thing that is always the problem. Like someone thinks, you know, like they're kind of approaching something from a first principle and that like, this is the way to solve the problem. And actually they don't have the context of the three times that they've tried this before because it was, wasn't documented anywhere and someone's on the wrong time zone. They don't want to have to wait 12 hours to talk to the person. So are there any kind of specific tactics or resources or even like platforms you use to, to kind of build that in? So Slack looks, I have a love hate relationship with Slack. <laughs> I have a love hate relationship with email too. So it's kind of, I mainly email. have a hate hate relationship with Slack. So I'm kind of with you. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I can be really effective is getting into kind of updates and, and making sure there's a communication trail. So we really embrace that. We try to get things rooted in providing as much context as we can in the project channels. And we've even got to a system where we use certain tags to notate if something is just FYI, you need to know this, there's nothing to do, to do it's not actionable versus things that are actionable that we kind of notate as critical. And we want folks to, to jump into. And we've operationalized that. We also built in a uh, document, like a memo-based culture, where we uh, memorialize decision-making. 
And uh, even uh, we do it through a DACI framework, but it's a really simple mechanism to understand. Is this a one-way door decision? Is this a two-way door decision? Who are the stakeholders that need to be involved? And making sure there's time in advance of that for folks to be aligned on the perspective and then ultimately to, to ratify and make a decision so that teams can, can move forward. But I really believe in, and I kind of grew up in that culture, I guess, at Netflix after five years. But the thing that helps us so much at at Calm, at, Calm, at Linktree and had to, helped us at Calm too, was this idea of context, not control. And you even talk about, I think there's a comment in the chat about, or a question in the chat about like, how do we make the website look local? It's a really great question. And even like little nuances of language and words, like we don't use the term mate. We wouldn't say things like brekkie. We wouldn't, you know, like, and in the US, you know, vice versa, there are plenty of those kind of little nuances to language that are really actually important to where to, to feel like a local brand, a local local business. And so we just had this, uh, this morning, we were talking to Alex about a campaign, Alex, our CEO, our co-founder, and he was kind of questioning some of the language. And Dave, our creative director who sits in Los Angeles, is just like, he kind of just stumbled. He's like, we just wouldn't say that in, in the US. Like, we just wouldn't, we just wouldn't do that. We just wouldn't like approach it that way. And the feedback I gave to Alex, and as we talked about it after, is like, you kind of have to lean on the local teams at a point or the local agency or whoever it is to make a decision, to make a call. If it's based on an initiative that we want to hit, whether it's Australia or we really wanted to land in the US because that's the goal, then you really do need to make sure we're just setting the highest level context so that those teams feel really empowered to make the right decision, even if it's about copy or something really, really small because it, it can make a big difference. Yeah, no, I think that that, that makes a lot of sense and that and that resonates with my experience of kind of moving from the UK here as well. Very like small things. And and also having worked at a company where we had like multiple employees around the world. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think there were a couple of questions I didn't get to, but I always like to give people three minutes before they start the next meeting <laughs> just out of a, a, a kindness of forgiveness. But Look, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And look, if people want to get in touch with you, where should they go? Yeah, absolutely. Shoot me an email. It's just Monica at Linktree. And I'd love to chat. I know we didn't get to a few things, so I'm happy to set up some asynchronous talks. This was great. Thank you for inviting me.